Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our session, laying the groundwork for a water conscious private sector. I'm Kirsten James, the director of the series water program, and I'm very happy to be participating in World Week, Water Week with you all. In this session today, we have a great group of co-conveners and speakers. I'm joined by my colleagues Ambika Jindal, Jay Falmogetti, my colleague Robin Miller, and three institutional investors, uh, Christopher Flemsberg, Eric Nish, and Nadia Franson, who will all be sharing their thoughts and perspectives during today's session. Just to give you a quick sense of our time together today, We'll start off with a few opening remarks and then have a little fun and test your water knowledge with some trivia questions, really getting to set the stage for the responsibility of the private sector in valuing water. And just a note for the trivia section, we'll be using the polling function on Pathable. So hopefully you all are experts by now. And after that, we'll move into a brief overview of series valuing water finance initiative, and then turn it over to Jay Felmogetti for an update on some of our private sector research. And we wanna spend the majority of the time hearing from the investors and financial institutions. So we'll turn over to my colleague Robin for a waterfront chat with some institutional investors. And then we'll close the session um, with a, a bit of Q and A and some final remarks. So we'd really like you to leave today's session with a greater understanding of how the private sector is valuing water and how stakeholders can really come together to scale these efforts and the resulting positive impact to water resources. So with that, I'd like to now turn the virtual mic over to my colleague Ambika Jindal at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she is the lead of the Valuing Water Initiative. So Ambika, over to you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the session. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, I won't take up too much of your time because I know that there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up, especially our panel with our investors. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit about Valuing Water Initiative, we're working very closely with Sirius um, and are very appreciative of the work that uh, them and their partners are doing for us. The Valuing Water Initiative is one that was launched at Davo in 2019 by the Dutch Prime Minister. Uh, this was in response to him and 11 other state heads signing up to the Valuing Water Principle principles, uh, which were launched by the, high, uh, by the high level panel on water, the United Nations and the World Bank. Uh, and he's, he asked a simple question, which was, you know, these principles are beautiful. They talk about how you must recognize all the values of water. Uh, you must reconcile the different values that you find. You must build trust, innovate, invest, educate, uh, protect the sources, you know, all of those good things. But what does this look like in real life? I mean, it's it's nice to sign up to this, but what does it mean? So our initiative's job is sort of to operationalize these principles, understand what solutions that are based of these principles look like. And we learn something quite simple in that process, which is water cannot be valued in systems that are broken. So if you're looking at a system, take food, take mining, take textile, if the incentive in that system to keep it so robust is lowest price wins, and water is simply a commodity that feeds into that, you cannot value water in that system. So we've taken it upon ourselves to ensure that we don't work on a project level or on a regional level, but really try to look at these systemic issues and say, okay, how do we change these systems within which water is a key constituent, a key uh, critical actually dependency for a lot of these systems? How do we actually change that? How do we make sure that water is valued in policy, in decisions and in behavior? Uh, so that's what we're working on. We also realized that SDG 6, which is about clean water, is not about taps and toilets and pumps and dams, because that's what people often think it's about. It's actually about making sure that water, which is a key input and a key ingredient of making sure our systems actually are resilient, uh, is valued across the different businesses, across sectors and across the different SDGs. It plays a very important role in ensuring that our SDG agenda can be met. Uh, what's actually very interesting is that investors are saying the same thing. Investors are saying this is no longer something that we used to say, you know, water is a non-financial risk. We look at water if we have time. It's not important. Climate is important. Things have changed. Investors have moved on. They realize that water is critical, important, uh, is critically important to this, to their business resilience, to their reputation, to making sure that they can actually continue to operate. And they are treating water as such. So it's important for us to hear from them, understand from them what their pain points are and address them. 
Uh, part of how we do that is actually thinking about the trillions that these investors control, is working with Cirrus, for example, on the Valuing Water Finance Task Force, which Kristen will tell us a little bit about uh, just in a bit. But we're also working with CDP, Water Footprint Network, and Mercer Investors in understanding how to improve the transparency around water. So ask FIs more meaningful questions about what they should be talking about when they talk about water, and also benchmarking them on that performance so that they feel the pride to do more and they also feel the pain when they don't. Uh, and by doing that, what we're trying to do is ensure that it's not just us, the governments and the water experts having conversations with corporates, but also investors having these conversations with corporates about how they address water security. So that's a little bit about the Valuing Water Initiative and what we're trying to do. I will hand this back over to Kirsten, uh, who will tell us a lot more about our, our cooperation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Ambika, for sharing those important insights and for all that you and your colleagues are doing to amplify this, this great work um, of so many organizations. So next up, we have a few water trivia questions. And so just for our audience members, please go into uh, the Pathable polling feature, um, and you'll find these there. So our first question focuses on global water quality. So the question is, what percent of the world's wastewater is still released into the environment without treatment? So if you can go into the platform and put your responses, we'll see uh, if you all get it right. Give you a few seconds here. All right, well, you guys are all pros. Um, it's very clear. Um, so the correct answer is, which uh, I think 90% of you are getting right, is over 80%. Quite staggering, um, but we all know the reality of this situation, unfortunately. Um, and this comes from a World Bank report um, uh, titled Quality Unknown, the Invisible Water Crisis. So moving to our second question, what percent of holdings in the S&P 500, Russell 3000, MSCI World, and MSCI Emerging Markets indices are in industries of medium to high water risk? So I'll give you another few seconds to put in your answer here. All right, a lot of folks are saying it's over 50, I'll give you a few more seconds here. So again, you all are uh, very in tune to these issues. Um, so the correct answer is greater than 50%. Um, and so uh, these again are the holdings and in these indices that experience medium to high water risk. And this um, statistic is taken first from some research series did looking at water footprinting a few years back. And so now to our last trivia question. So the question is, according to CDP's latest water report on company disclosures, the cost of inaction for companies is over what times the cost of action? Is the answer five, two, or seven? Give you all a few minutes or a few seconds. And I know this report has been discussed at other sessions this week, so hopefully it's fresh in your mind. All right, uh, sort of split between five and seven. Um, and the correct answer is actually uh, five times the cost of action when addressing water risk. Disclosures through the CDP indicate that the potential financial impacts of water risks are far greater than the costs of addressing them. And this is from their 2021 report. So thanks for um, all participating in the, in the trivia. It's really highlighted, um, as many of us are well aware, that there's really a clear need for the private sector to do more to address water risks. And so that's what um, we're going to be talking more about today. So how can we significantly scale this work um, that is being done? Um, and that is the, the question we want to cover. So I'm going to just share a bit, uh, getting at this question, actually, of uh, the Valuing Water Finance Initiative, which Ambika alluded to in her remarks. Um, but first, just a little bit of background on who we are and how um, Ceres is approaching this work. 
So for more than a decade, Ceres has worked with influential institutional investors, Fortune 500 companies, and nonprofit organizations, many of you on this session, to address the global water crisis. Ceres really has expanded our focus on work with institutional investors in recent years as we really you know, continue to see the water risks play out in real time and the impact um, on financial performance also playing out in real time. Um, we've been making some notable inroads that we're you know, very proud of with, with many of you all um, working side by side with us. But the matter of the fact is that companies aren't moving at the scale and scope that is necessary to address the scale and scope of the water crisis. So with that, Ceres and our partners at the Dutch government and many others have um, put forward the Valley Water Finance Initiative. And this really brings a new innovative approach designed to move capital markets to view water as a financial risk and then act on it accordingly. So as part of the larger water community's efforts to advance water management, we are focusing our efforts on institutional investors and ultimately the corporations that they own who can then drive that wholesale change. So this initiative is really designed to provide the tools investors need to make the case, so to speak, to prioritize water risk and successfully engage with corporate leaders on water. So on this slide, you'll see the various components of the work and how they fit together. And I'll just take a few minutes to unpack these various components of the initiative. So first off, the Valley Water Finance Task Force is really a central pillar of this initiative. And the task force is comprised of 14 pension funds and banks from around the globe. And these institutions have identified the importance of water and uh, for both their institutions and for their investments and they have committed their support to help guide this initiative, provide insight to this initiative and provide their leadership to this initiative. Also importantly, we have uh, an investor working group um, that's working you know, side by side with Ceres and the task force. Again, um, a group of, of institutional investors, asset managers, um, and they are helping us to inform and guide the work um, and serve in this leadership capacity. So I mentioned that we're trying to build the, the business case, so to speak, to really compel investors and then companies to act on water risk. So part of building that case is developing a really comprehensive scientific assessment on water. And you'll hear more about this effort from our principal investigator in just a few minutes. But um, you know, basically just sharing a few thoughts on, on why we're, we're developing this piece of work. So there's no doubt that there's a plethora of scientific and academic research that has been done really outlining the threat of the water crisis. However, it hasn't been synthesized or articulated in a way that can really support investors in building the case for addressing water risk. So our goal with this research is to present the science in a manner that really clearly and concisely depicts the global water crisis and compels investors to engage. So this work is informed by a broad group of, of scientific experts in many uh, areas, uh, any, many water disciplines to really help ensure that we've built that strong scientific case. The other element that we are working on to, again, build, build the case and build that foundation is uh, financial materiality briefs. So in order for institutional investors to really take water seriously, we need to make the risk tangible. We need to make the business case for water. So our goal with this work is to clearly outline the risks of failing to act. And this work is underway and is being done in partnership with Blue Risk, our data provider S&P Global, and asset manager DWS. So we're really excited to share that work out later um, this year. So stay tuned on that. And then all of these efforts and uh, discussions with our task force members, with our working group members, will then feed into what we're calling the valuing water expectations for companies. 
So a significant challenge that many investors face is the lack of that science or context-based target on water. And I know there's a, an evolving field on that, but there really isn't a clear North Star or framework for water similar to the Paris Agreement for, for climate. So as an investor, it's really hard to engage with your portfolio companies on water without having a really clear set of expectations or knowing you know, what really to ask of the companies that will move them and create that on the ground impact. So that's where the corporate valuing water expectations come in. And again, those are being co-created with our investor partners and with input from many stakeholders in order to give investors that framework where they can successfully engage in conversations with companies. And these asks will form the foundation of engagement efforts with some of the worst um, actors in, in the private sector. And so ultimately, you know, these engagements um, and initiatives will, will drive the change that we're all looking for um, on the ground. And our partners are really crucial to the success of this initiative. Uh, we use our shared knowledge, resources, and areas of expertise to stay aligned. We don't want to reinvent any wheels, and there's a great, um, great work being, being done in this space. So we are working together to collectively make progress at scale and address the water crisis. And as I close out this segment, I just want to bring back to the broad picture of how we see the momentum driving us towards impact. So when this business case and foundational research is complete, we will be prepared to launch a global investor engagement with companies. And this is really where that on the ground impact will happen, where we can work to drive down individual company water risk and the sorts of portfolio level and mispricing risks that are created through the broader negative externalities created by the most polluting and water wasting industries and value chains. So this is where we're headed. We're excited to bring you up to speed on some of the work today um, in, in this session, um, and then um, additional pieces of the work will be rolled out um, later this year. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jay Falmogetti. He's the director of the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan. His prior positions have included being a senior water scientist at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and a professor of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. So Jay has been leading the research on the global assessment for private sector water impacts, which I've mentioned. Um, and so I will turn it over to Jay. I'm Jay Famoyeti. I'm a water scientist and a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, where I lead the Global Institute for Water Security. I and my team are pleased to be leading the Valuing Water Global Assessment in partnership with Ceres. For over a year now, we've been conducting a massive scientific literature review that will culminate in a series report that has the following goals. We'll identify and characterize the largest private sector driven threats to freshwater. We'll identify those sectors, industries, and practices that lead to the most severe threats to freshwater. We'll characterize certain private sector driven threats as systemic, and we'll identify where climate change is having a multiplier effect. We have a real opportunity here to provide series and investors with a rigorous scientific underpinning to arm them with the information they need to really help move the needle on corporate water stewardship and sustainability. And we're really excited to be able to play this role. There are several unique aspects of this report that I wanna share with you today. First, as I mentioned, it is fully science driven and being written by a world-class team of water scientists with backgrounds in water quality, quantity, economics, social science, and climate change. Second, we're viewing the relationship between industry and water as two-way. Industry impacts water through its effects on the health of water bodies, as well as on a range of other physical, chemical, socioeconomic, and cultural hazards. But water also has an impact on industry through climate change, changing extremes like flooding and drought, through input water quality, and through legacy contamination. All of these can occur up and down the supply chain and upstream and downstream of companies. Third, the report is highly collaborative. We work very closely with the series team and with high level advisory groups, including the Scientific Advisory Committee, the Valuing Water Finance Task Force, and the Stakeholder Working Group. 
As someone who's devoted his career to researching, understanding, and acting on global water security, it's clear that deep industry engagement is required to really have an impact. Globally, industry is responsible for, for a full 80% of water that's withdrawn from our rivers and from our groundwaters. Through this report, we really hope to highlight and raise awareness within industry and also with decision makers and with the general public of the systemic risk of freshwater threats to society, to the broader economy, and critically to investor portfolios. These risks are on par with those of climate change and carbon dioxide. They are pervasive and they have until now been undervalued. We hope that this report will play a pivotal role in driving much needed change. Our work to date has identified and confirmed well-known threats in industries, but it's also identified several emerging threats as well. For example, we've been taking deep dives into the food and beverage industry, apparel, semiconductors, and metals and mining. And we've worked with the broader series team on developing selected materiality briefs. But we've also identified emerging threats to battery manufacturing, to packaging, to paper production, and to aquaculture. Water use by the apparel industry is on the rise. The growth of green technology will need more raw materials for metals and mining. Social conflicts in water scarce regions are on the upswing. Our work is showing that current and emerging contaminants that pose critical risks still include nutrient loading, metal contamination, and pharmaceuticals, but are increasingly including microplastics and the persistence of the forever PFAS chemicals is becoming more and more apparent. Our report will include a set of action steps for mitigating risk, which we will co-develop with Ceres, the Valuing Water Advisory Groups, and with investor partners. And the report will end with key recommendations for action steps that key sectors, industries, and companies can take to reduce adverse impacts on water, and how industry can become more active in collective action, together with governments and researchers, to improve water stewardship and sustainability. Our hope is that these recommendations will help articulate actionable expectations for responsible water use. In closing, I think that the summer of 2021 has underscored the urgency for greatly increased corporate water stewardship. The impacts of climate change through flooding, drought, and fires have been disastrous across the world. Agricultural productivity in my home country of Canada went to zero. Supply chains around the world have been disrupted while water available to industry and the water returned to the environment by industry is increasingly under attack. We hope that our report can help spur a timely and much needed corporate response. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for those remarks and giving us a great update on where the research is at on the global assessment. My name is Robin Miller and I am a manager at Ceres working on our water team on investor engagement. And I am pleased to moderate this next portion of our session with several investors who are part of the Valuing Water Finance Task Force and our Valuing Water Investor working group. So now that you have a better sense of what we are trying to achieve with this work, I'm excited for you to hear from these investors themselves, what's driving them about uh, being, being excited in this work. And I, I think that these three investors all showcase different perspectives about how to take action on water. I have a few questions for them to kickstart this, uh, what I'm calling a waterfront chat, and then we'll open up to take some audience questions. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat within Pathable, and we will get to those in a moment. Um, so just at first to start off with, uh, with the three of you, um, would like to have you all introduce yourselves to our participants, um, your role and, and where you are in the world and what's happening with water. So I'll first uh, turn to Eric, because I know that you're, you're based in Singapore. So it'd be great to hear, uh, and thank you for joining us at this late hour for you, but uh, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about your role um, and what, what's going on with water in Singapore. Thanks, Robin, and, and thanks, Kirsten, Amika, and Jay. It's, it's, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, my name is Eric Nietzsche, and I head the ESG research and integration for Manulife Investment Management in Asia. 
Um, I'm the chair of the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change, Physical Risk and Resilience Working Group, and also a member of the Investment Leaders Group of the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. Um, if you're not familiar with Manulife, we have a, a pretty large presence in North America and Asia with 800 billion in AUMA and um, a, a strong footprint on the ground in Asia. So I work with credit and equity teams in 11 different uh, countries or jurisdictions or across the region. I think in water in, in Singapore and Asia, I think is, is especially critical because Asia has about a third of the world's freshwater resources, but supporting 60% of the world's population. And those resources, I think, are very vulnerable and very at risk, um, both because a lot of them are, are uh, coastal and, and subject to sea level rise and saltwater damage, but also a lot of the world's supply chains run through Asia. And so those freshwater resources are especially vulnerable to um, risk from pollution. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited that the, the Valuing Water Finance Initiative is, is, is global and addressing these issues in the region that I'm working in. Great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and we'll be glad to hear more of your perspective through our conversation. But I'll go to, to Nadja next, uh, who I know is in the Netherlands, just to hear a little bit more about your role, uh, Aktiam, and what's happening with water where you are at. Yeah, thank you, uh, Robin. Um, so I'm Nadja indeed. Uh, I work at Aktiam as a responsible investment officer. Aktiam is a Dutch uh, institutional investor. Um, we are committed to investing responsibly. What we actually see in society is we see a transition towards a more sustainable uh, society coming. And we expect the companies in our portfolio to be prepared for this transition um, in order to accurately manage it. Um, therefore, we have um, drafted several drivers that we think um, will be the most profound uh, in this trans transition. So it's, for example, climate change, um, land use, also some social drivers, but also uh, water use. Um, and on these drivers, we really uh, focus the screening of our companies to see whether the companies accurately deal with, uh, with the transition on, on these drivers. And we also conduct engagement uh, with these companies on these specific drivers to, to improve their, uh, their management. Um, yeah, so I'm based in the Netherlands indeed. And what I actually see here is... Um, yeah, most noticeable is the increased intention for uh, water related issues. I think we always uh, have been really conscious about water. Of course, we, we are below the sea level or part of the country is. Um, so we, we know how to deal with water and how to protect ourselves against flooding. Um, but the thing is, we always had an abundance of water and we actually are pretty used to just draining as much as water to the sea. Um, but what you see changing now is, um, of course, as in many other countries, is the climate. And actually, over the past couple of years, we, we have had uh, drier summers and therefore ground uh, water levels lowered. This caused problems with industry, with farmers. Um, so that raised attention to the topic. And then this year is actually pretty different again. We, we have pretty intense uh, rainfalls, often very local and unpredictable. And therefore, uh, last month, even part of the country was, uh, was flooded. So I think these events have led um, the Netherlands as a country, but also some, uh, some of our neighboring countries to reconsider water management, to, to focus on catching rainfall um, yeah, when it falls and then storing it for, for the more dry periods and to evenly distribute it uh, around the country. And I think with that, you see a trend of new initiative uh, focusing on, for example, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, etc. cetera, to, to really have this focus on real-time uh, data on water levels and improved uh, prediction on precipitation and how to deal with this. And this is 
visible through all sectors, so on governmental level, but also within companies, uh, farmers, investors, all wanting to use this, uh, this new type of data. So I actually, I think this is uh, a pretty exciting development and yeah, something to watch also for the future. Great, thanks Nadja. I, I know um, that access to data, remote sensing, information in real time is something that all of us are really interested in as well. So thanks for sharing that perspective and we may dig into that a little bit more. Um, so, so I'll turn to Christopher next to hear a little bit more about what you do at SEB. You're, you're one of our founding members of the Valuing Water Finance Task Force and have been with us on this journey for a while. And also to hear you know, what's happening with water in your part of the world. Um, I believe you're, you're in Sweden, but I know you, you hop around. So uh, Christopher, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And you might be muted. Um, uh, yeah, better yes. now? Oh, good, Excellent. yes. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for all the good work you're doing at Sirius. Uh, it's highly appreciated. So my name is Christopher Flensburg. I'm head of what is called Climate and Sustainable Finance at the Swedish bank SEB. And, and we engage of two reasons. Uh, first of all, we are a bank. We're giving financial advice. So this is very much about risk and opportunities. I will come back to that in a second. But also because we, we find that we have a, a role as a corporate citizen, as individuals, to actually address these issues and, and implement that in, in the way we work and the mandates we're giving internal as well, as well as the advice we're giving to our clients. So that's 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 what we're doing and, and why we're engaging. Now, what we're seeing, what we're observing, I think a lot of it has been mentioned. I, I mean, this is about water quantity and it's about water quality. Uh, we saw the, the, the disaster in Germany or also in Holland and Belgium. Uh, we're seeing a lot of cases like that. We're seeing droughts around. And according to scientists, this is going to, to increase. The storms and the droughts and the, and, and, and the floodings are, are going to be more frequent. And that means that there's a, a significant society risk as well as a, a significant uh, financial risk embedded in this. And our reason for, for, for engaging is, of course, first of all, to be capable of, of continuing working for, for, for many, many, many uh, hundreds of years as a bank, but also to make sure that our, bank, our clients are getting the right advice and that they understand the risks that they're actually taking and, and, and engaging in. So what we're, what we're seeing right now and what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, that is that climate mitigation, so reducing pollution, carbon uh, removal, is, uh, is now a part of any investor's kind of daily checklist. And, and, and that is uh, a part of any bank's daily checklist. So all clients are being asked, uh, small clients a little bit less, but it will be more. And, and big clients are being asked to disclose much more. And, and we expect, and that's also what you're hearing here, that within the next one and a half to two years, all investors and all, uh, all individuals will be asked about their water footprint. And eventually that will mean that there will be a value on water as we are talking about. And, and that means that there's a financial risk as well as a lot of opportunities in creating new systems and creating efficiency models and, and, and navigating in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a water scarce world. Um, we didn't talk about that early on, but, but there's, in, in, there's expected to be a very, very significant shortage of water, clean water, within the next five, 10 years, uh, meaning that a lot of people will not have access to clean water. That is gonna lead to migration. Uh, that's gonna lead potentially to, to war, unfortunately. We have seen that before. It's going to lead to industries being challenged and it's going to lead to human disaster as citizens of this world and as corporations uh, we are we are we, we need to act we have to act and as financial players we need to understand the risk that we're taking and the way we advise our clients in this context so this is in a very very short nutshell going back to what we see in our part of the world we're seeing a couple of challenges in respect to water so a big part of the, the um, of, of Sweden's wealth is built around the Baltic Sea, uh, so we have a, a sea in our backyard, and and that sea is is basically being drained from oxygen, um, and that means that there's a lot of dead uh, bottom on the sea, and 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 there's a lot of abuse and misuse of the of the, of, of the sea in general, and if we don't manage that now, we're going to have a, a, a backyard that's um, that's not looking too nice and which can't feed the future in the way it has been feeding the past. And, and consequently, we have a, a, a close and, and, and present need to address our home, home challenges. Alongside that, we're also having challenges with, uh, as we just heard from Holland, with the change in rain patterns. So we see extreme rain 
and then we see drought periods. And with extreme ra rain, we have problems with our cities, and I think that most cities in the world are facing this, because the drainage systems in the cities and the concrete that's been built into the cities are not equipped to, to withdraw the, the water in the, in the speed that is raining. And that means that quite often when we have rainfalls, we will have five, 10 centimeters of water, maybe even more on the streets. And, and, and that is also gonna get more extreme. And that means that our cities, as well as our corporations need to understand this to be capable of, of navigating the future. What we're seeing from the final side, from our side, that is that we're moving where we normally looked into a historical kind of credit perspective. We're now do, looking forward and trying to incorporate things like climate, things like water management in respect to the way we're lending and the way we're investing. And, the, and that, is, uh, that is the change we're seeing right now. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah, and, and I think all, all your remarks resonate. I'm based in the, the Boston area in the United States. And just on Sunday, we had uh, a, a hurricane coming up through this area, which is very rare. And then today uh, we have a bit of a, a heat wave. It's very warm here, here in the area. So these, these big fluctuations are, are here, they've arrived. Uh, I also believe July here, which is normally a nice uh, sunny summer time, uh, was the, the wettest July on record uh, in this region. So you're really feeling these effects. Um, so the next question I have is, you know, getting into some of the pain points. I know a lot of folks joining today might not be investors or, or from the private sector, but want to learn a little bit more about what your pain points are. What are your barriers to taking action? All three of you shared some of these um, great steps that you are taking. So um, I'll go to Eric, or actually, sorry, I'll, I'll switch up the order. I'll go to Nadja first. If you want to share, you know, what are some of the pain points that you're, you're feeling what are some of the barriers um, for you to take more action? Um, yeah, first, we, uh, we see a lack of data availability. Of course, as it, it is improving and we see more and more companies reporting uh, on water use and how they are managing water. But still, it's very difficult to really get to the essence of it. Um, I think this is partly because uh, the, the lack of a scientific framework and the, the very localized nature of the water problem. Um, with climate change, of course, you have the Paris Agreement and every uh, company, every sector knows more or less what is expected from them. We, we are committed to the one and a half degree and every sector has drafted a pathway uh, on how to get uh, to this stage. I think for uh, water, this is uh, pretty different because water is really a local issue. When you look at the global level, uh, we are still within the planetary boundaries uh, for water use. But when you look at local level, there are really regions that, that are uh, that face water scarcity, that are having trouble, tr troubles uh, related to water pollution. So I think this is really the key here, that um, as investors, we don't always know uh, from our portfolio companies what locations they exactly have operations in, and especially not when you extend it to the supply chain. Um, and then even if you know these locations, then it's still difficult to, to know what is the local situation, to know what the local needs are, what are the biggest issues, and how companies can um, help in restoring the water balance in a, in a specific situation. So therefore, um, for us as investors, it's really difficult to, to evaluate how uh, what the impact is of the actions that companies take. You can see, for example, a company that has set a water target to reduce 15% of its water use, which is great, but it's really difficult to translate this target towards the impact on, on a local uh, basin, on a local watershed. Of course, when there is plenty of water in that basin, it it has less effect than when the basin is running dry. So I think this is uh, something difficult and it really uh, asks from investors, but also from companies to, to look at the issue per region, uh, to acquire in-depth knowledge on a specific region, to maybe include NGOs or knowledgeable local uh, networks to, to gain this knowledge and to 
to ask what it is that companies have to do and how investors can help companies in this. And yeah, this is difficult. And I think it will take some time before this can Im be implemented at scale. You already see some initiatives that are going into that direction. But before we will have such a structure for each catchment in the world, that, that will take some time. Thanks, Nadja. Yeah, and I know a key a key word, and we'll bring this back up when when we get close to to wrapping and giving some call to action is translate. How do we translate um, really complex water information into a risk language that resonates with investors? So uh, for all those of you tuning in, you know, really pay attention to that word translate. So Christopher, I know we talked a little bit in our prep call around some of the pain points, and Nadja touched on this with some of the data, but uh, wanted to see if you if you wanted to expand on. What are some of the pain points for you and that or even frame you know, what are the opportunities as well yeah so 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 the, the, there's two parts uh, where we have pain points the one is is in respect to the infrastructure so we are lacking data uh, we don't have the knowledge uh, we don't we need to educate uh, our staff and and then we need to create systems so we can monitor and assess um, so it need to be integrated in the system and that will take years uh, the report coming out now is, is of course a, a very good step stone for doing that uh, but then you need to to create um, institutional ownership to take the next level. Another another challenge we're feeling uh, a pain point we're we're feeling that is the 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 water being a common good, uh, right? So we all feel that we have free access to water, and frankly, I I like that. I appreciate that. I don't want it different. There might be people saying that it would be better to give it to a hedge fund. I don't think that's the, the right thing. I think we all should have access to water. Um, however, uh, the 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 infrastructure need to be owned by the public uh, and that means that the uh, the investment is done by the public meaning that it's going to be paid by taxes and and that means that that upgrades of the water system so for example when you have water pipes and pumps transporting water in a city you lose often you lose 20 to 30 percent um, in in the transport from old pipes and pumps um, so so simply just because the the equipment is not top and according to industries which i'm talking to you can upgrade these these water systems and get return on equity of seven to twenty percent, which is a great investment for any pension fund in the world or any investor in the world. However, at the second you do that, you need to pledge the water infrastructure, and at the second you pledge it, it doesn't belong to the government anymore, the municipality. And 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 in that way, you you're basically you're basically a, a little bit in a in a trap, where we need to find mechanisms where we can actually help the public to to upgrade the water systems. Um, by addressing the legal uh, issues, the technical issues, as well as the financial issues, and allowing them to 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 do parallel funding to the budgets, but but paying back the the, the investment with the the high high uh, return there is on these upgrades. So there's a lot of opportunities, but there's also some structural challenges that that, ha that means that these things are not happening. And I think alongside that, there's a there's a, a tendency in in many industries that water have been given and maybe very very cheap. And I think that we need to change the awareness about the the, um, the potential shortages of water. Well, not the potential, the, the coming shortages of water that's going to be in the systems and, and, and basically make sure that, that people understand uh, where we're heading and, and thereby also appreciate that efficiency is, is, is a good investment as well as the right thing to do for the globe. Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's interesting to hear your your pain points, but how you also see them as opportunities. And um, and another piece we'll we'll hone in on is is this need to collaborate. And I think something I was hearing from you is that you know there's multiple actors involved. Some folks are water experts. Some are you know deep in the weeds on the finance or the technical side. Um, and we do need to collaborate more effectively and efficiently to be able to to have this path forward of a more water secure future. Um, so Eric, uh, turning to you next around, you know, what are some of the pain points, especially in the context that you're in? Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing? I know you're in a, in a different geography than, um, the, than some of us. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's, you know, different geography, but I think it's, it's a lot of the same, same pain points, you know, especially around, um, you know, geo-specific asset level data. Um, you know, I think if we could unlock that, then it would would uh, open up a, a number of different things. And so, you know, I think those those have been well well covered. And so maybe I can just give a quick example. Um, with, you know, one of the things that we try to do as investors is think about the implications of 
uh, you know, this, this pandemic that we've been living through. And one of them is spending a lot more time inside and a lot more time in front of um, <laughs> screens, you know, like this. And so that puts a lot of demand or it increases the demand for, for semiconductors. And so you may remember earlier in the year, there was some uh, very unusually cold weather in the Southern United States, and that actually froze a lot of pipes and was a real manifestation of water risk to semiconductors, which needed that water. And that was very disruptive in the US. Um, that should have been a great opportunity for companies in Asia to, to build that market share and really run with that dynamic of increased demand, except they were also running out of water. So Taiwan was facing, you know, what was a once in a hundred year drought, which will probably be a once in five year, or once in 10 year drought going forward. Um, and so we had to, uh, you, you know, we were trying to figure out which companies had assets where and which reservoirs were really running out of water and where those operations would be disrupted and have a business and financial impact. Um, that was really time consuming and really difficult to do. And so, you know, I don't, th I think it's not impossible, but better data around things like that would really help. And, um, you know, so just because there's not data doesn't mean that we can't do it. You know, I think the, the Ceres Water Hub provides an awesome guidance and is a fantastic resource for how to think through and how to approach analysis like that. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the, uh, the pain points are, you know, well covered, but hopefully that's a, you know, example that brings it to life a little bit. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, the case study of semiconductors is a, a very fascinating one to follow. Um, so I have one last question. And also if you, if there are any audience and participant questions, feel free to put those in the chat. We'll turn to those next. Um, but, but all of you have decided to, to step up and join the Valuing Water Finance Initiative in some way. So I'm just curious to hear, you know, what do you think that, that we're doing, this work that Ceres is doing in collaboration with, with many partners in the government of the Netherlands? Um, how does this have the potential to transform the way that investors and companies value water? Um, so Christopher, I'll, I'll go to you first on this one, since you've been, you've been with us for a long time in this journey. So oh, I, I think that that um, basically what what investors and and the banks are doing in general that is that we have a checklist in respect to when we invest money, right? So we're going through a protocol and say, okay, what is the area we're going into, and what, what is the, the risk and the potential and the, the management and 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 the surroundings, political stability, and all these kind of things. So that's the protocol we go to when we lend and invest. And I think that what is happening here that is that 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 protocol is going to be changed. And I think that the work you're doing, um, getting so much notice together and so many people together uh, with the strong support from, from, from very important stakeholders, I, I think is enabling uh, most of us uh, to, to start changing our, our ch checklist, our protocols, or the way that we invest money and lend money. And by doing that, we will most likely, uh, that is my expectation, show the rest of the, the financial society that we're actually coming out with a better risk return so we are being better in managing the risk and foreseeing potential risk in, in semiconductors or whatever it is. And thereby the rest of the industry will actually follow through with such a protocol. And, and thereby um, it's gonna be difficult uh, to get access to money without knowing how to manage water in the future. So I think that's what, what, what you're doing, what we are doing and where we can, where we can support. Um, alongside that, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, the more notice, the better you can navigate. And alongside that, there's going to be a lot of, of um, enrichment. I mean, at the end of the day, if we can make a, a change as individuals, as institutions, in the way that we, we handle water and, and engage with water, uh, we've done a good job, right? Thanks, Christopher. Um, I'll turn to Eric next, if there's anything else you want to add on about how this work, how you see it having the potential to transform the way that we view and value water. I think one of the biggest things is setting very clear expectations. And, you know, for, for all the reasons that Christopher mentioned, I think the investor voice can be very, uh, very powerful and influential in terms of um, encouraging corporate action. And I think that the, this initiative will really amplify that voice in a number of, of really wonderful ways. 
So, you know, one is I think it will bring together investors to make that voice more unified. Um, you know, I think it will send a, send a clear message and, and make the messaging very clear through those expectations. Um, and that will make it easier for companies to respond. And I really, really believe that that can be transformational and impactful. Thanks, Eric. Um, and Nadja, I'll, I'll turn to you next on this, the, the transformational power of this work. Yeah, I think a lot has been uh, said already, and I can only agree uh, with what has been said. Um, yeah, I think the main opportunity is to, to enhance understanding and indeed provide a common framework on how investors can um, talk with companies about water. It's Everybody knows at some level that water is important, but um, there hasn't been this push from science, from uh, the, the price of water. There has not really been this push to, to really uh, let companies, let investors value the water. And I think um, this initiative has the potential to, to provide such a push. You also saw it with climate change after the uh, Paris Agreement and then initiatives like uh, the TCFD, then companies and investors really came together and they saw the need for the topic and they started to act. And I think this uh, initiative, this framework um, can provide a similar uh, stimulus. It's investors have a standardized framework then to ask companies about. Companies know what questions to expect. They can see for themselves, okay, uh, what am I already doing right? What still needs to be uh, developed a bit more? And um, yeah, and this can can enhance, I think, the field of water management uh, in general. Great. Well, thanks all. I'm just going to do a quick check and see. Uh, we have a little bit of audience chatter, just uh, um, some really affirming comments about what you all have shared, especially the connection to uh, more of a localized context. So that's great to get that feedback. And then we did have one question that came in just around, you know, what are um, what are some of the platforms and data resources that you're using? So. Um, I know Eric and Nadja, I know you're in the weeds there, but maybe if you all want to share like your quick, you know, what's, what's your suggestion of uh, what we can do? So Eric, I'll go to you first. Sure, I think um, just, just to kind of name a few that, that uh, we, we rely on, I think the CDP team, you know, that's looking and working at water is fantastic. Um, MSCI and Sustainalytics, S&P True Cost, uh, Bloomberg, WRI, um, and so, you know, I guess one kind of quick piece of advice to anyone on the call who's maybe from an academic background or an NGO background, and if you feel frustrated that investors are maybe not um, seeing the same things that you're, you're seeing, uh, you know, I think working with those data providers is a way, great way to get those messages to investors. Thanks. Um, Nadja, any, any data sources you want to call out or, or affirm of what Eric shared? And we also had a comment, a uh, question about the AWS standard too, if that's anything that, that you all work with. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we work with a lot of the same uh, sources as Eric just mentioned. Um, the AWS standard, but also other standards, they are um, often very much integrated in these uh, these sources. For example, the data providers as MSCI and Sustainalytics, um, and we use those data providers. They, they already look at the water management of a company and they're in that also whether the, uh, the companies align with these uh, type of standards. Um, so yeah, these are definitely integrated and it's also something that we use in engagement uh, with companies that if we ask them for their water management and they, uh, yeah, they reply what, uh, by asking what should we do then, then indeed we often refer to, to one of the standards that are out there because yeah, we can, uh, think of something new, but if the standards that are out there uh, are good, then why not use them? Um, and yeah, I already mentioned it a bit in the in the beginning. What I see is uh, developing are the the remote sensing, the real time data. Um, uh, yeah, startups often. 
And we are currently not using that very much already, but I do see a big potential. And we are uh, within Actium reviewing whether this could be something also to use, because uh, for example, on water scarcity, we use uh, aqueduct data and that's already very helpful, but it's once a year it's updated and you eventually what you want to go to is to have uh, the real time data and to see, okay, there's a drought now, so companies need to act right now. And I think this is a, another source that uh, could play a big role uh, in the future. And the, the Valuing Water um, Hub, the series has a, a great stock take of, of a number of, of platforms that have been um, that have been mentioned, but goes well beyond that also. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I can drop that in the chat, uh, but we have a, a specific database that we have tracking all the various platforms. And, and Christopher wanted to give you a chance, I know from the bank side, you may have some different resources, if there was anything you wanted to, to share before we wrap up. Yeah, so I just uh, just want to add in, I mean, all the, the data sources being mentioned, I, I think is relevant, and, and especially uh, the last comment in respect to to new startups. So we're working with some AI companies, which are actually uh, extremely promising in respect to being capable of comparing solutions across regions, across uh, disciplines, uh, basically meaning that, that with the new tech system coming in, there will be a, a much easier access to data and also comparability of data from, from, from various, um, various suppliers. So, so I, I think that, that we are about to see a change in, in, in the way of navigating. Going a step back, I, I think it's important to understand why we're using data, right? So on the one side, there's, of course, compliance. So we all, investors as, as banks, need to be compliant to regulations and, and need to understand how companies are acting with this. And, and, and some data providers will give that kind of an insight. Then there's a risk aspect. Of, so whenever there's a mismanagement or abuse of, of rights, uh, we had a big story with a... With a a drink provider down in India a couple of years ago, which were really damaging for their business and, and brought them into a lot, a lot of law cases because they, they didn't clean the water they used afterwards and polluted a lot of water and that brought them massive challenges. Uh, so there's a lot of, that's, that's going to increase. So there's going to be the risk factor, the legal liabilities and the way that, that water is handled, not only in your home turf, but also in your production facilities across the world. And then there's, of course, going to be the opportunities. And depending on, on where you look, you will, you will need to look at different uh, different um, uh, data providers or different, different data data cooperation partners. Uh, from my side, I'm, I'm, I'm a born optimist. So, so I would always look for the one that's, that's, that's giving me the opportunities and the and shifts. But, but from a banking side, from an investor side, that is the three kind of parameters you will look at, compliance, risk management, and potential. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, it's a good, a good note to wrap up our panel. I think we have uh, a few minutes left, so we'll now transition. Um, but a big thank you, Eric, Nadja, Christopher, for sharing your wisdom, your perspective with us. So we'll, we'll move to closing out our session today with some calls to action. So as you all have heard today, the water sector has a lot of complex and fragmented asks. We all have busy agendas and limited resources to to really work forward on the action and the storytelling. So water doesn't always uh, get the attention that, that we always think it needs. Um, so a few next steps for you. If you're uh, an investor, you can get involved in the Valuing Water Finance Initiative. We need a broad tent. Uh, you've heard from some voices today. If you'd like to get involved, please do reach out to us. For those companies on the call, we believe that these corporate expectations will be a resource to help lift all boats. We know many of you who are tuning into this session are already doing really good work, and we need all hands on deck to work to solving the water crisis. So you can look forward to the corporate expectations on valuing water to be released next year. And then for the water experts, we heard these terms um, that, our, that our panelists mentioned, you know, this this need to translate and talk the language of companies and investors. So they really understand water as you um, are perceiving it and giving it the, the priority that it needs. And then collaboration. It's not just uh, signing up with more agreements with companies, but we need to simplify and agree on some concise goals around achieving SDG 6 so that we can all put 
our effort into this. Um, so I know the session is wrapping up. We have one more poll for you that will stay open just to hear what some of your key takeaways are from today's session. So as we close, you can, um, you can fill that out for us, but thank you for your time and attention and wishing you a great rest of World Water Week. <laughs>